Every single year there's that one movie that gets nominated for the Oscars that everybody loves, but I just can't get behind. And this year that movie was Manchester by the Sea. But for half of this movie, I thought it was going to be this one. <laughs> so thank God for that back half of this film. But I will get to that in a moment. Uh, hi everyone, this is our lead up to the Oscars in which we were taking a look at all the films nominated for Best Picture and giving you our quick open Oz discussion about it. Uh, I'm Aaron. And I'm Michelle. And I... she didn't see this movie. No, but I'm here for emotional support. Yeah, because, <laughs> listen, I've done two of these by myself up here and I've come to the realization even if she doesn't say a word, just having someone here to talk at <laughs> rather than talking towards the wall behind yes. this camera. Yeah, that's why a lot of these times I'm like looking at you when yeah. you're talking because it's like it's easier to just listen to someone that's right next to you instead of like, you know, trying Pretending to... like yeah. you're facing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, it's like we were about... This is the last one that I'm recording today because my voice is shot. And we were about to go like, all right, you can head on out here. And I was like... I can't do another one of these by myself. I'm a jumbled mess when I record these things by myself. Did you see the Moonlight one that I did, people? That was garbage. I had to cut like five or six times during that. Oh. Uh, but okay, uh, let's get into this. The film that we're talking about today is Hacksaw Ridge. And this is a film that I just want to go ahead and say this is a real life story of this war hero who was a conscientious objector. Like he was a very religious and spiritual person and he believed that it was wrong to commit acts of violence against other people but at the same time he saw other people out there going out there and fighting for their lives uh, for, fighting for his life fighting for everyone back home this was during world war ii and he was like it feels wrong for me to have other people going out there to die for me while i just stay back here so he decides he's going to enlist but he's going to enlist as a medic so that he doesn't have to actually fire any guns. And even the other mechs carry weapons on them, just in case. But he's like, I'm not carrying a single weapon on me. And that's the first half of this film. The first half of this film is him deciding to enlist. The first half of this film is him going off to boot camp. And it's also them going, all right, pick up your rifles. Why aren't you picking up your rifle? I'm like, well, I believe that I shouldn't have to pick up a gun. Which, by the way, that's the voice that Andrew Garfield gives his character throughout this entire film. <laughs> and I will go ahead and say this. As someone who grew up in the South, whenever British people do Southern accents, it really bugs me because I have never heard a convincing one. <laughs> Even ones that sound convincing, there will come that moment in which I'm like, no, it's fake. <laughs> Like, uh, the guy who does Rick on The Walking Dead, there are moments where I'm like, that's a genuine southern accent, and it's gone for the next five minutes. Okay. Uh, but I will say this. This is the best southern accent I've heard a British guy come up with, because, yes, it's cartoonish, and yes, it's exaggerated, but it's at the exact same level throughout all this. It's not like he's dipping into a different accent or going into something else or losing the accent altogether for a moment. It's that accent he chose throughout the entire film. And as exaggerated as it sounds, I knew people with that voice. <laughs> so it's like, you know what? This is it. Whenever someone says what is the best accent that a British person had for a Southern person, this is it. I actually had like two British people come to my store a few months back and they're like, doesn't it bug you when British people do Southern accents? And I was like, yes. And they said, and they're like, what about The Walking Dead? We love The Walking Dead. That's like a good Southern accent. I was like, no. <laughs> Not even close. That's like if like you walked up to a British person and it's like, would you find it annoying when Americans try to do British accents? Like, <laughs> You guys must hate that. Yes. But the thing, is, <laughs> the thing is, I've heard British people do regular plain old American accents. Like, you know, just the standard American accent. It's like, they do it fine. It's specifically the Southern accent, where it's like, you guys, that's like an endurance test for you. Like, you can't keep it up for too long. Uh, but yeah, he keeps this up throughout the whole film. It's like, all right, cool. Um, but yeah, that's the first half of this film, is him, like, fighting for his right to not have to fight in this, in this war, but still go out there as a medic to just try and save people. Mm -hmm. And it's nice... You know, there's a nice little romance in there. Uh, you feel for the guy, but it is just shot so cartoonish <laughs> in the first half. And this is directed by Mel Gibson. And don't get me wrong, I have a lot of problems with Mel Gibson personally as a human being. But he's a talented director. I gotta give it up for him on that. 
So I kept looking at this like, what the hell is wrong with you? What <laughs> happened to you? And why is everyone else loving this film? Why is it getting such good reviews? Because the first half of this, like, there are so many, like, slow motion scenes. Like, the moment anything gets dramatic, it goes slow motion, but people are still talking in slow-mo. And, like, his dad is, like, this drunk who went to uh, World War I, and he came back from it just all, like, in shock. Like, he was never the same after this. Like, his mom even says, I wish you could have known him before he went off to war, before he became what he is now. Because you see him just out at the cemetery all day just drinking around the tombstones of his friends. Like, he's clearly, like, the one person who made it back from his whole group. And, uh, but he's, like, this drunk, and, like, there's a moment he comes home, and his two sons, like, this is a flashback when they were little kids, his two sons are fighting and rolling around, like, punching each other, and he just, like, stumbles past and steps over them, and then sits on the porch and goes, Block him with your rights. Like, that's all he says. <laughs> And, like, and the mom says, why aren't you stopping? He's like, why? Let them fight. Then I only have to whip the one that wins. Like, it's so goofy. <laughs> but then there comes a moment in which, during this fight in which, um, oh God, what was, uh, I know his last name is Dodds, but what was, give me five seconds here, people. Desmond, his name was Desmond. Uh, there comes a moment in which the protagonist, Desmond, he picks up a brick and hits his brother in the head with Ooh. it. Yeah, and after he did that, his brother goes down, and he's just sitting there like, Oh, God, what I, what I do? And then there's a slow motion scene in which he's walking into the house, walking up to, like, a big tapestry that they have of, like, a religious thing, and, like, it's a Batman origin. <laughs> it's like, yes, Father, I will become Jesus. Like, basically, he just slowly walks up to it, like, this is what I should do. This is... I've screwed up and I will never do it again and I'm going to devote my life to this and it's like, don't get me wrong, I can understand that happening, but it's like, it is shot so cartoonishly and when this is happening in slow motion, his dad comes up from behind him in slow motion like, yes man, now I'm gonna have to beat you, son. And he's taking his belt off in slow motion and he says, like, that's literally like what he said, I'm like, is it wrong? I kind of want to laugh at this. Like, this is horribly shot. Uh, but I will say, talking about that moment in which Desmond hit his brother, uh, I really kind of connected to Desmond in that moment, because uh, I'm a pretty even-tempered, cool-headed guy now, but back when I was in school, I was this kid who got picked on all the time, and I would, like, fight back. And there was this day in which... Uh, this kid, he had been picking on me all day. He just kept calling me names and like during the middle of class, like right in front of the teacher and the teachers were like, I don't want to deal with this. So like he would just let the kid keep <laughs> saying all this stuff in the middle of class while he's trying to teach. Uh, or like as I was trying to write notes, the kid would lean over and like draw dicks on my notebook. Like just messing with me all day long for like hours straight. And then eventually I just snapped and I jumped on him, grabbed him and slammed his head into the wall so hard I heard a crack and in that moment I just stepped back and like everything slowed down like I couldn't hear anything like all the sound was muffled around me so I was like because yeah I thought I killed the guy he turned out to be fine uh I gave him a concussion but he got over it and after that we were the best of friends like, <laughs> he literally never messed with me ever ever again after that so not telling you kids out there how to deal with your bullies but just saying um, but yeah, so in that moment, as cartoonish as it was shot, I understand what they were going for, and I had been there myself in that moment. So I was like, you know what, I, I can't fault you too much for this. If you just hadn't have had Hugo Weaving come out and be like, I'm gonna beat you, son. <laughs> was that God the thing damn it. That, was that what got you? <laughs> That was, that, I think that was the main thing. Then also the fact that it's like, I almost killed my brother. Jesus, slowly <laughs> go to him. Between this and Ben Hur, this was a year full of Jesus just being the answer to all these films. <laughs> uh, but that's what, but unlike with Ben Hur, that just came out of nowhere in the last five minutes, this one, the film was based around that. This is a film based around a guy who's like, he actually did follow the words and the teachings of Jesus and was like, I don't believe causing harm to my fellow man, I don't believe in this, I don't believe in that, 
but I want to save people, and that's why he enlists in the army. And again, even when he gets to the army, it is still cartoonish when he meets all the other people he's going to be serving with. Like, he goes like, here are the two guys from New York, and they're guys with like, pencil mustaches <laughs> and like matchsticks hanging out of their mouth and like the gamma's like hey ooh, why you, why you forget about? and there's another guy and goes we call that guy Tex and he's got a rope and he's doing lasso tricks and I'm like, are you kidding me with this crap it's like and here are all the stereotypes you're going to be dealing with i know i was like this is a skit on the simpsons like it's homer joined the military this you might as well have had Lenny and carl in the background on this <laughs> Oh my god, it was so goofy. And I was like, this was supposed to be real. And like, apologies if these were actual real people and they did behave like this, but for a film, it just looks like a joke. Uh, and Vince Vaughn plays his drill sergeant, and I will say this, Vince Vaughn, shockingly good in this. Been a long time since I've been able to say that. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, Vince Vaughn comes in here and he is the drill instructor and he does the same thing that all drill instructors do. They all try and do the uh, full metal jacket, yeah. uh, the army thing. But he's actually, his insults are actually kind of clever. I gotta admit, they're some of the better written insults I've heard a drill sergeant give people. Uh, they're offensive and all that stuff and I know someone's gonna be like, oh, this was an offensive thing that he said, but it's like, they're drill sergeants, that's what they say. At least they wrote it well. Like, they wrote it really humorously. They wrote it really clever. Uh, and he carries out every single line. Uh, but I love that when it gets to the point in which he has to go and basically he's going to on trial to see if he can be dishonorably discharged uh, because he refuses to pick up a weapon. Um, he... I'm sorry, I'm thinking of some of the insults that Vince Vaughn gave. I was like, yeah, that's kind of funny. <laughs> but um, there's a moment in which he uh, is there and they ask, why are you not going to pick up a gun? Why are you not going to try and defend yourself? And Andrew Garfield gives a speech about why he doesn't want to. And it was in that moment that I was like, you know what? He's getting nominated for Best Actor this year. I can see that. He's not going to win. Denzel Washington is going to win for Fences. And I will, if he doesn't win, I will be pissed. But Andrew Garfield, you deserve the nomination. All right. Uh, by the way, I just realized Andrew Garfield played Spider-Man. This is basically the Captain America story without the super soldier serum. Because he's also like, weighs 90 pounds in this entire film. So it's like, yeah, this was the Captain America story, wasn't it? Oh, okay. He's just going to play all the Marvel heroes. Yeah. <laughs> You won't let me be Spider-Man? Fine, I'm going to take all your heroes <laughs> and win Oscars doing it. Uh, yeah, it actually, this actually made me really upset that they didn't keep Andrew Garfield around as Spider-Man. Uh, but okay, so as I said, aside from that one scene there, I was like, this is kind of goofy. It's kind of cartoonish. The love story between him and the nurse he meets, it's pretty good. But aside from that, everything's just so cartoonish. You keep saying cartoons so many times, like, maybe this should have been, like, a Disney animated film or Andrew something. Andrew Garfield does look like a Disney prince. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, there could be songs, too. I mean, hey, if they can, like, do that with Mulan, why can't they do it with this movie? Andrew Garfield might as well have had bluebirds coming down on him. That dude is so chipper and upbeat. <laughs> but... <laughs> then they actually go to war, and they go to Hacksaw Ridge, and it is this giant cliff on a shore and it turns into a horror movie for the second half of this film and oh my goodness that's when this movie begins <laughs> screw everything else that happened before this i had problems with that the second half of this movie is amazing like that was when i was like now i get why people like this movie uh so yeah, it starts off with them just staring up at this massive cliff, and they go, don't worry, our friends in the Navy are going to help us out a little bit. You see these naval ships just fire on that ridge, and you just see fire go up against the entire coast. And they're just sitting there going, nothing could survive that. And then one of them goes, they could. And it's a moment which is like, again, that could have sounded cartoonish. That could have sounded like way too goofy. But no, you're in it. Like, that little like fire sequence is shot so well and that cliff is so intimidating that you're like oh my god they're gonna go and fight dragons they're gonna go and fight those great wall dragons that's what's going to happen here 
Uh, but no, they get up there and just instantly that people start dying. And you might be thinking, oh, I saw a Saving Private Ryan. I know what a really effective, uh, like, storming the beaches moment where people are dying. I know what that looks like. No, you don't. This makes that look Hollywooded up. And that's one of the things I will say. When they actually start fighting and people start dying, people start getting blown away, it is like a solid half hour without a break, or at least it felt like it, of just combat going back and forth. And in that moment, I just thought, wow, this, again, the biggest compliment I've been giving all the Oscar-nominated films this year, they all feel real. All of them feel more realistic than most films I ever see get nominated. I looked at this and went, I feel like now I understand how horrifying war is. Like, you always thought you knew. But this one, you look at, and like, when they were just walking up there, and you see like the corpses of the people who died before this, and like there's just rats eating them there, and there's still like just meat blown away from people just sitting there. And then when people start dying, it's not like, you know, they get hit in the head, and they're just like, there's a hole there with some blood coming out. Like, no, stuff explodes out of them. And there's people, like, they get shot in the helmet, and the helmet goes off, and then they get hit. And it was like, oh, the helmet does nothing. The helmet gives you, the helmet is one heart in Zelda. That's all it is. You take a hit. Now you're, now it's really, you will die if you get hit again. I feel really terrible that I just, <laughs> that I just uh, compare war to a video game. But I was like, that's kind of what it was. The helmet is your one hit that you get. That's it. And like people are just getting knocked out. Like when things explode, you see their legs go off. And you needed that in this film. You needed that in this film, first off, to contrast how crazy the beginning of this film mm -hmm. was. But also, it's because this guy is a medic. And he's the guy who is not willing to pick up a gun no matter what. You need to put him in the worst possible situation that you could imagine to show that's how strong this guy is, that he is still not going to pick up a weapon, but also it makes you realize he is raising out there to these people whose legs have been blown off, like they are bleeding nonstop, their organs are coming out of them, and he's going to save them. It made you realize what an amazing thing it is that he is doing. Uh, but yeah, this whole film is just, like after it gets to that point, it's some of the most gruesome stuff I've ever seen. Like there's a moment in which they're being shot at and they can't see what they're doing. One of the guys finds a dead body down there at his feet, like the legs are blown. It's just the torso and up. He picks it up and uses it as a shield as he's marching forward. And I was like, dear God, this is horrifying. Uh, it's one of the best horror movies I've seen all year. Uh, but then it gets to that point which you're like, we gotta go back down. We got like, this is it. We can try it again tomorrow, but there are still people up there and they're injured. And Dodds, uh, Andrew Garfield's character, he will not go back down. He refuses to go back down. He stays up there and he just keeps going in with like no support. Nobody else is in there with him. He just keeps running back in there like all throughout the night for like 12 hours straight, running back in there, grabbing people, taking them over to this ladder, uh, to this rope ladder that they built. And this is an example of how this film could have been, could have not worked, but it absolutely did. There was a moment when they're training and they have to learn how to tie a knot and he can't get the knot right. He creates knots with two loops on it and they're making fun of him for that. When it comes time for him to lower these people down, he's like, how am I gonna do this? He creates the two loop knot again and is able to hook them into that and lowers them down. I was like, that could have been one of those things in which I'm like, oh really, that came back, all right, whatever. Instead, I was like, cheering that thing on. I was like, the rope came back, everyone! Yeah! The rope is gonna save the day! Him and his weird hoops! <laughs> Woo! Uh, it's like, like, if it were up to me, it's like, oh, he's finally gonna learn how to tie the knot correctly and use it. It's like, nope, he's gonna use Even better, yeah. It was like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, you were destined for this, boy. Alright. But yeah, it's just non-stop him going in and saving people. Uh, with like the weapons they have, which one of the things I love is that they showed like how different the uh, equipment was that they had back then because like he's got morphine and it's like a little tiny tube of toothpaste with a needle on the end of it. Like there's nothing like fancy, no like needles or anything. It's like just like a tiny little squeeze bottle thing they puts in there. But like it shows you how great of a character this guy was, uh, which again, it's based on a real life guy. 
he saved 75 people in the real world. And it's like, I don't know if it was exactly as bad as they portrayed it, but like I said, this made it feel like that's what war actually is like. So watching that, I was like, holy cow, the idea that he had to go back into that over and over and over again, and he refused to go back down there uh, until he could save as many people as he could, it really does make you realize what an amazing person this was. And again, so many things like the rope that comes back is like, that could have been cheesy, but it was so good. There's the moment in which they're retreating and like fog is all around him and he just starts praying and he says, Lord, I can't hear you anymore. I, like after, like it's the, he's losing faith moment in which he's like, I can't hear you anymore. I don't know what to do anymore. Just please, please tell me what to do. And then you hear someone way out in the fog go, medic, medic. And he's like, all right, and goes back into the fog, and again, that could have been like, oh, really, the guy just, all right, yeah, fine, whatever. It could have been one of those moments. Instead, you are cheering that moment on. You are right there with him. Uh, it is an amazing thing to watch this guy just save people over and over and over again, and it's not like just a montage of him saving people. Like, every single time he saves someone, it's different. Like, there's moments in which the Japanese soldiers are coming by, and they're just, like, stabbing all the dead bodies with their bayonets. Um, and there's a guy, he's injured, he's barely alive, and you see him cover him up with dirt and go, remain calm. And like then he grabs the dead body, puts it on top of him to try and act way. Mm -hmm. And like the dead body on top of him is getting stabbed, and he's staring over there at the guy with like his one eye peeking out from the dirt, like just being like, be cool, be cool. And it's like, so every time he has to save someone, it's different. It's a different situation, and you're tense every single time. Like there's a moment in which he has to go into a foxhole. And like grenades are being tossed in after him into the foxhole and he runs into an injured Japanese soldier and he puts like bandages on the guy and gives him morphine. And I was like, God, this guy really is the greatest American hero. This guy really is like what you want to think of when you think of a hero. And again, I don't know if every single thing that they show in here happened, but the mere fact that he kept going back over and over again to save 75 people. It's stunning. Like, this is not one of those times in which I'm going, well, what he did in real life is great, so I'm going to applaud this movie that shows that. Like, you know, Sully did an amazing thing, but I heard very mixed things about the movie. This isn't one of those situations. This is where the guy in real life did something amazing, and they made a movie that really captured that feeling. Uh, and, who? Yeah, really, I got nothing else to say about this film other than just, like, it is an amazing montage of just this guy being a hero. And it's got very weird pacing, but you're so into that second half of the film that you don't really care. Like, you don't really care if, like, it doesn't match up with the quality of the first film, of the first half. You don't really care if, like, it is just a full hour of just war and him saving people and doesn't really follow any kind of like a flow. It's like you're just in there that entire time. Like this is a great example of how like I said when we reviewed Manchester by the Sea, pacing is a big thing that I look for in film. Like if you don't have really good pacing it is going to be a problem for me. But this is an example of how a really good film can break that. How it doesn't have to follow that rule. Um, I will say though just as a warning uh, like I said, this was made by Mel Gibson, and I have a lot of problems with Mel Gibson as a human being. But I didn't see a lot of that in this movie. Until it got to, towards the end of them trying to take Hacksaw Ridge, and you start seeing the Japanese soldiers a little bit more, and it kind of like hit me, oh yeah, right, Mel Gibson's been revealed to be kind of a racist. Uh, so that was a bit of a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... I'm taking a point off from that. Uh, this would not have made it into my 10 best films of the year list, even if we had seen it when we were making the 10 best year. Uh, even if we, I saw it when we were making my 10 best movies of the year list, simply because A, the first half of this film, kind of weird and goofy and cartoonish, and also because that kind of served as a bitter taste there at the end of the film. But so much about that second half of the film is really darn good that I can fully understand why so many people loved it. Uh, but yeah, that was just my thoughts. Thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, we got three more of these to do. Hopefully, we're going to try. We still have not seen the final three movies, and we got like 12 hours to see them all. <laughs> so, fingers crossed. 
But yeah, let us know in the comments down below what you thought of Hacksaw Ridge. And if you want to see all the other Oscar films that we're covering, make sure that you click on the playlist that is coming up at the end of this video. Bye, everyone. Bye.